Sometimes words are enough. Sometimes it's fine to use phrases like I'm excited or I'm mad. It's simple, it's direct, and it gets the point across. But human minds are not always that simple. And sometimes the well of emotion bubbling up from underneath our consciousness is so overbearing that it becomes impossible to express through language alone. And when that happens, it's not enough to say I'm mad. You have to say Screaming has been a part of singing for as long as singing has existed. But eventually, as singing conventions calcified in the Western world, the use of screaming in music was eventually seen as improper and undesirable. These days, however, the use of screaming is ubiquitous in almost all sectors of popular music, to the point where certain genres of music employ vocals that feature nothing but screaming. It's been a long road to where we are today, with decades of shifting vocal trends and musical developments, and it can be difficult to keep track of where it all began. Who was it that launched the scream into the mainstream? Well, easy, it was Lil Richard. In fact, if you have even a passing interest in music history, you probably already knew that. But even if Lil Richard was the one to popularize it, he wasn't the first. And that's what I want to explore in this video. What was the first use of screaming in recorded popular music, and who was the first person to do it? But before we can do that, we need to define what a scream is. My definition is as follows. A scream is a vocalization which is categorized by its loudness relative to the singer's natural singing volume, its high pitch relative to the singer's natural singing register, and its rough and or piercing textural quality. This is by no means a scientific definition, and there's plenty of wiggle room in there for personal discretion on my part, but all in all I think the criteria are reasonable enough for the purposes of this video. But it's important to note that I'm interested in screaming in a musical sense here and not screaming in general. Take this clip by Corey Glover for example. Now, I would definitely call this a scream, and it fits my previously listed criteria, but it's also undeniably musical in nature. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for singers who use screaming as an approach to singing. Not just a scream, but screaming as a stylistic effect. So to narrow my definition further, I will include some additional criteria to do with musicality. With our criteria set in place, our search can begin. I'll start at 1970 and work my way backwards through time. And what better place to begin than one of the most influential screamers out there? Ian Gillen is a hard rock vocalist famous for his involvement with Deep Purple, the Ian Gillen Band, Gillen, and Jesus Christ. Gillen's soaring vocals are iconic. His high notes had this unique, piercing quality to them and featured his characteristically wide vibrato. In fact, Gillen's approach to screaming would go on to become the gold standard for rock and metal vocalists for decades to come. Ian Gillen might not have held up as well throughout the years as his contemporaries, but in his prime, he was an unstoppable screaming machine. And it's easy to see how Gillen and Deep Purple managed to influence a whole generation of rock singers. But even though Gillen is often credited as the apex of this style of screaming, he didn't necessarily invent it. For that, we need to talk about one of the hidden titans in heavy metal history. One of the most influential yet underlooked singers of all time. And his name is... The artist I'd like to choose as my rock god is Arthur Brown. Is Arthur Brown. So Arthur Brown. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Arthur Brown is one of the unsung heroes in rock and roll history. His influence on not only the vocal style, but also the aesthetics of rock and roll was immense. In fact, let's get the checklist out. Corpse paint, check. Elaborate pyrotechnics, check. The hottest dance moves, check. The voice. I can never tell you lies. It's so boring. 
Arthur Brown's approach to screaming was a result of combining the fundamentals of classical vocal training with the raw expression the likes of Wilson Pickett and uh, James Brown. The end result is a piercing banshee-like wail, but with immaculate control. A sound that would inspire the metal style of singing for decades. And on top of that, Brown has enjoyed an insane vocal longevity for a rock singer. For example, here's Ian Gillen trying to replicate his deep purple material at age 76. Now obviously those high notes are a lot weaker than they were 50 years ago, uh, and that's to be expected. These kinds of vocal acrobatics can be very taxing for the voice, and expecting someone to be able to maintain the same vocal power in their mid-70s as they had over 50 years ago is frankly absurd. Anyway, here's Arthur Brown at age 76. <laughs> Incredible. In fact, Arthur Brown is still performing to this day at age 80, god bless him. But back to 1968, by the time Arthur Brown broke into the mainstream, the scream had been a staple in gospel, blues, soul and rock and roll for about a decade. But if you want to talk about the earliest pioneers, I'd say there's about three people who are the most to blame for the proliferation of the scream in popular music today. And the first one is James Brown. James Brown might be the most essential screamer in all of music. His raspy yells have become ingrained in pop culture and have been parodied, reused and recycled to such a degree that James Brown remains the most sampled artist of all time. James originally made a name for himself as a soulful crooner in the 1950s, but as the years went on, his vocals became more and more potent. And by the turn of the decade, James was going absolutely ham, producing some of the gruffest, roughest, toughest vocals ever captured on tape. One of the things that James Brown had over his contemporaries was the sheer variety of screams he had in his arsenal. He could do the Wilson Pickett type screams, he could do the piercing falsetto screams, he could do those really pinched screams on the e-vowel, he could do whatever this is. Ooh, that hurt, you could tell. The earliest instance of James Brown screaming on record, as far as I know, would be his 1957 rendition of Chani on Chan. The second person in our howling trinity is the least well known of the three, but undoubtedly the coolest, Screaming Jay Hawkins. The legend goes as follows. Blue singer and middleweight boxing champion of Alaska, Jay Hawkins, had just penned the nice romantic ballad called I Put a Spell on You. But as fate would have it, during the night of the recording, Hawkins and his entire band got blasted on mimosas, and the song that was supposed to be a solemn ballad was perverted into a raw, guttural blues hit that changed music history forever. The success of I Put a Spell on You would see Jay Hawkins completely altering his image. His stage shows became more theatrical. The now christened Screaming Jay Hawkins turned into this outlandish caricature, starting every live set by emerging from a coffin, frantically babbling nonsense at the crowd, and carrying a chain-smoking skull on a stick named Henry. These were the beginnings of shock rock, and the theatrical antics of Jay Hawkins would greatly influence rock and roll performers for decades. However, for Hawkins, this revelation was bittersweet. While his sany stage gimmicks had given him commercial success, it came at the cost of his musical identity. You see, Hawkins always wanted to be an opera singer, and whilst his outlandish persona made him successful, he felt that it obfuscated his real musical ambitions. If it were up to me, I wouldn't be screaming Jay Hawkins. James Brown did an awful lot of screaming, but he never got called screaming James Brown. Why can't people take me as a regular singer without making a boogeyman out of me? Sadly, Jay Hawkins never got the chance to be the star he wanted to be, but a star he was, performing all the way up to his death in year 2000. The 
the third and final person of interest is, well, it's Little Richard. Little Richard is undisputably the godfather of the scream and a direct influence on pretty much anyone I've named in this video so far. And understandably so. Picture this, right? You're in 1955 and the vocalists on the radio sound like this. Ain't gonna miss the thing, I'm gonna have my place. And this. I see your lips. And then along comes Little Richard all. Where's the one to the right? She to the left. So down a bitch gonna run with a dare. She knows how to run. It was mind-blowing at the time. Little Richard was truly a landmark in not just rock and roll singers, but basically all of singing going forward. I'd argue Little Richard was the real catalyst for the scream creeping into the hit charts. In fact, we need to look no further than the B-side of his first major hit, Tutti Frutti. And so, from then on, the scream echoed out in music history, leading us to where we are today. But, what about before Little Richard? Well, that's when things get a lot murkier. There is one name, which I've failed to mention so far. A certain soul genius, often forgotten in the conversation of famous screamers, but important all the same. Ray Charles started off as a smooth, jazzy crooner, copying the style of his big idol, Nat King Cole. But while this landed him gigs, Ray sought room to innovate and develop his own vocal expression. And so he did, blending together the sounds of R&B, blues, jazz and gospel into his own raw style. The first scream in Ray's catalog is from Come Back Baby, released in 1954, actually predating the earliest of Little Richard's rock and roll recordings by a couple of months. Now both Richard and Charles pull a lot of vocal inspiration from gospel music, but in Charles' case we can narrow his source of inspiration down further. Here's a quote from one of his trumpet players, Wallace Davenport. Charles used to talk all the time about Archie Brownlee and how much he liked him. Then he started to sound like him and began working the audience into a frenzy. Archie Brownlee, that man knows his shit. Archie Brownlee was a gospel singer mostly known as one of the founding members of the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi. The Five Blind Boys of Mississippi were a gospel quartet consisting of five blind boys, which would technically make them a gospel quintet, go figure. And they were boys. When the group was formed in 1936, Brownlee would have been around 10 years old. The group was originally envisioned as a jubilee-style quartet, which entailed uh, putting on a formal image and singing with a restrained, respectful style, basically following in line with Western musical tradition at the time. But in the mid-40s, the group changed their direction as a harder school of gospel was beginning to take hold, and their music and live performances started to get more unhinged. And they kicked their basing around because he got his vision back and was thus no longer welcome in the group. But maybe most importantly, their band dynamics started to shift. Archie Brownlee would slowly morph into the front man of the group, providing the lead vocals for the band's most popular songs. That right there was an excerpt from the song Our Father, their first major hit, reaching the number 10 spot in the R&B charts in 1950 and becoming one of the first hit songs to feature the use of screaming. The earliest recording by the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi to feature a scream was from their rendition of Jesus Traveled This Road Before. This was recorded way back in 1948, and it was at this point that finding anything earlier would start to become difficult. Lucky for me though, I had some candidates in mind. First one, Candy Candido. I'm way down ya. Oh, Candy Candido was a voice actor and singer, probably most famous from his many roles in the original Disney Golden Age, including singing the bass harmonies in the original Grim Grinning Ghosts, as well as voicing the Chief in Peter Pan.
but Candy would occasionally lend his voice to novelty tracks, showing off his ability to rapidly transition from a silky falsetto voice into a deep growl. You get no bread with one meatball. I was hoping his vocal acrobatics would yield some interesting results for this video, but sadly, after combing through his entire discography, I found nothing really resembling a scream. So the search continued. Next candidate, Charles Kellogg. Charles Kellogg was a very interesting man. He was an inventor, craftsman, mechanic, but most of all he was passionate for nature and nature preservation. He even made his own car, carved from a giant redwood tree, which he called the travel log. But his most famous endeavor was that of a singer, specializing in bird song. During his recording career, Charles would sing many classical and contemporary songs in an extremely high-pitched bird voice. And notice I said sing there, because as the legend goes, all of his bird noises were made using his vocal cords, which mmm, not sure if I'm buying that. I was born with the gift of singing as a bird, and the scientists have discovered that the reason for this is in the formation of my throat, which is identical with that of the bird. Yeah, sure thing, Mr. Flakes. He also claimed to be able to extinguish flames using only his voice, claiming that fires could be tamed through outputting a note at exactly the right frequency, kind of like a tuning fork. He claimed that the fire extinguishing systems of the future would ditch the whole water thing and simply emit a loud noise at a specific frequency that would quench the fires without any further mess or material harm. But guess what, you busty son of a myth? This myth got busted by the Mythbusters themselves, who demonstrated that fires could only be put out at low frequencies and at a higher volume than the human voice is able to produce, thus proving once and for all that Charles is a liar and a fraud. But Charles double take back sees bust back because he performed it successfully using the sensitive flame apparatus, which is an old ass invention from the 1800s to showcase experiments with fire in a controlled environment as detailed in the 1876 article sensitive flame apparatus for ordinary gas pressure and some observations thereon. And while only being able to demonstrate this ability in a rigorously controlled environment does kind of undermine the whole fire extinguishing system of the future idea, he is still technically correct. An acoustic fire extinguisher prototypes do exist, go figure. But for this video I wanted to know if any of Charles' vocal acrobatics could be considered screaming. Well luckily his musical output has since been archived in its entirety, which means I can go ahead and listen to all of it. And as it turns out, no, not really. Even if some of the notes might be texturally similar to screams, the overall cleanness of the execution and the control and agility he has over his singing makes it difficult to assess any of it as screaming. Alright, so what else do we have? Well, we do have this little country classic by Roy Akuf and the Smoky Mountain Boys called Wabash Cannonball, which features a train horn imitation. That's almost a scream. It was at this point that I had just about exhausted my leads, and it was clear that if I wanted to find any screams from earlier than 1948, I needed to do some digging. So I asked my good friend DR, whose knowledge of music history is boundless, and he was very quick to dig up something good. Caledonia! Caledonia! I want to make your big head so hot! This right here is Caledonia from Louis Jordan and his Timpani 5, a number one R&B hit from 1945 and one of the early prodigens of rock and roll. Right off the bat we can see the influence this had on the likes of Little Richard. This was supposedly one of the first secular songs he ever learned to play, and you can clearly see remnants of this song within Richard's vocal stylings. Caledonia! Caledonia! So there you go, probably the earliest ever scream in a number one hit song, and possibly even recorded popular music in general. In fact, I was basically ready to call it quits at this point. But, as it turns out, I had one more lead to follow. There's an article by Tom Maxwell called A History of Musical Screaming, which has been absolutely crucial when it came to doing research for this video. And in the article, Maxwell mentioned Cab Calloway. More specifically, an early rendition of St. Louis Blues from 1930. <laughs> Alright, now we're getting somewhere. 
That sound at the end is definitely something that I would describe as a scream. However, I don't think it's particularly musical. Unlike the other screams featured in this video, this one is performed through sharply inhaling. This creates a rough, tire screeching like sound, but it's a lot harder to control melodically. Either way, this is definitely a solid lead. Cab Calloway was definitely one of the most eccentric crooners of his day, and it's entirely possible that he could have something that fits my criteria. So I sat through Cab Calloway's entire archive discography. All of it. Which was very annoying because Cab Calloway was famous in an era that predated the album format, which means that his entire discography is wildly unorganized. I had to track down hundreds upon hundreds of individual singles and listen to them all, hoping that I'd find something interesting. And wouldn't you know it? I did. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to something special. Many people in the past have heard this song before, but no one before me has been able to connect the dots. Let me present you with the earliest instance of screaming in recorded popular music. Yeah, so this video was a fucking mistake. All right, so Chinese Rhythm by Cab Calloway. It's certainly a product of its time. Some of the singing in it fits my definition of a scream, uh, so that's good. It also features Cab Calloway's highest notes ever. Woo. As you might expect, the cultural impact of Chinese rhythm has been fairly self-contained, and I'd argue that's probably for the best. There's a good chance that there are recorded songs out there with screams that predate Chinese rhythm, uh, and if you know any, please share them in the comments or somewhere else in my vicinity. But for now, I think it's a good idea to step back into present day. You know, I've been thinking. This whole time I've been spending hours obsessing over trivial, banal music history, and I've gained very little from it. I've spent this entire video talking about firsts and earliests, when really I should be more concerned about things like best and asbestos. It's fun to investigate these things, of course, I mean, that's why I do it. But looking at art through such an objective and qualitative lens, while rewarding in its own right, is straying far from what music is capable of doing. The real question I should have been focusing on is, what is the best scream in music history? Well, I don't need to look far to find that, I already know. And if you stick around for just a little bit longer, you will too. Thanks for watching. You guys ready? You ready for war?